Okay, hello everyone, welcome back. In this video I want to show you how to do all the stuff we did in the last video in Python. So let's open up a terminal window. On a Mac I'm holding Command, tapping Space, type Terminal. Then let's activate our environment. And now open up Jupyter Notebook. Now I'm going to make this on the desktop. We'll go New Python 2. Let's call it Slope. Now we can start typing some Python. So let's start with the definition of our cost again. So that's a function. To write the function we type def and cost takes an input called b and the cost is just b minus 4. 4 was our target we picked. Raised to the power of 2. So to raise something to a power in Python you just use two asterisks. So let's just prove that like 2 to the third power is 8. So 2 times 2 times 2 is 8. Okay, so let's test our cost. So cost at 0 is 16. As we get closer to the target, let's do cost at 2 is 4, 3 is 1. The closer we get, the lower the cost. So the cost at 4 is 0. We're right at the target. Okay, so in the last video we found the slope numerically. Let's try that here in Python. So to do that, I'm going to call it numerical slope, num slope at b. So it takes one input. Now that involved a small step size. Remember a small change in the input and we're looking at the change in the output. So we can pick anything we want here, just a small number. Smaller the better. Now we're going to return the cost at b plus the step size minus the cost at b divided by the step size. So that's the same formula we had in the previous video. Now let's try that out. So the numerical slope, if we're below the target, do you remember what the slope of the cost function is? It should be negative. And if we're above the target, you remember the slope of the cost function, then it was positive. Now let's define the actual derivative of the cost function with respect to b. So that's going to be a function. Let's call it slope. And if you remember, we have the power rule here. So we start with the same expression, so I'll just copy it. Now what we do is we bring the exponent out in front, multiply by it, decrement this exponent by 1, so it's just raised to the first power, which is just itself. Now we have to remember to take the derivative of this inner expression with respect to b as well, and in this case it's just 1, so we multiply by 1, and multiplying by 1 doesn't change the expression. So that's the final derivative of the cost function with respect to b. So we'll see why we take the derivative of the inner expression and multiply by it in a later video when we have our full neural network in place of b. It's something called the chain rule. It's going to be very important later on when we have a bunch of parameters and we have composed functions in our neural network. I want to thank Mohammed in the comments for pointing out in the previous video how I neglected to mention that you have to multiply by the derivative of the inner expression with respect to b. Even though the derivative is the same in this case, I think it's important to keep the pattern consistent. And I really appreciate that feedback. So I'd love any more like it too as we continue with the series. Now let's test the slope function out. So we can test the slope at 3. And we see we get minus 2. And that's very close to our numerical approximation of the slope up here. So that's a good sign. Let's test the slope at 5, and we get 2, so that's very close again to our numerical approximation. So it looks like this is working. Now let's look at applying our slope to minimize the cost and bring b to a target. So I can start b off at any value here, let's say 8. Now let's write our update rule, b is equal to b minus 0.1 times the slope at b. Now I can run that, and it's not very interesting. It, it ran, but we don't see any output. So to see some output, we can use the print function, and we'll print the value of b. And now we can see b is currently 5.6384. Now I can hold control and tap return and run this multiple times, and you can see the more I run it, the closer b gets to our target value of 4. I can start b off at minus 20, let's say, and run this. And you can see it's increasing, increasing, and getting closer and closer to 4. 
Now, instead of running this multiple times by hand, if I needed to run it thousands of times, my finger would get pretty tired. I can use something called a for loop to do it for me. So to do so, I type for i in range, let's say three. Let's start with a simple expression in here, print i. So if I run that, you can see we get some pretty interesting output here. We see zero, one, and two. Well, let's break down what this expression means up here. Let's first look at range. If I just type range of three, this is called a list. And this is a list of numbers starting at zero and counting up by one. And there's three of them. So if I say range four, it's a list of numbers starting at zero and there's four of them. So all this does is generate a list of numbers that's the length of the argument. Now if we go back to our for loop, all this is saying is for each of the elements in the list, run this code and set this variable i to be equal to the element. So if I just act like the computer here and evaluate what range is going to be, that's going to be 0, 1, 2. Now you can see the list explicitly. And all this is going to say is set i equal to 0, run this code, set i equal to 1, run this line, set i equal to 2, run this line. So instead of numbers, I could put names in here. And you can see I was equal to John at first, then it was equal to Jake, then it was equal to Jones. So this is a simple for loop. It's iterating through each of the elements in this list and running this code for each of those elements. So let's go back to range in three. But instead of a print statement, let's put in our update. And let's, all, let's print B now so we can see as B changes each time. So this is going to change B and then print the value of B. This expression here, this loop is really equivalent to this code here. We just copy it three times. So these are equivalent statements. It's just the for loop makes things a lot tidier. And instead of copying it a hundred times, we can just write a hundred and you can see it ran it a hundred times and brought us right to our target. So we can start, let's run it only 10 times. We can start B off at zero. And you can see we start at 0.8, 1.4, 1.9. We're climbing, 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 getting closer and closer to four. We can start it off at six, and then we're climbing down here, five, five, four, 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 and we're getting closer and closer to our target. So that's a quick introduction to for loops. You can think of this as your training, training loop, and really we're minimizing our cost and changing the output of our super simple neural network with no inputs to a target value. So we really are in effect training a neural network here in this loop. And this is typically what you'll see when you're training a neural network. You're gonna see a loop with many, many thousands or millions of iterations here. So in the next video, let's look at a more complicated neural network. One that actually takes an input and tries to predict an output. It's gonna have two parameters and really represent a line. And we're gonna fit that line to our data. So subscribe so you don't miss that video. Like or dislike this video. Like it if it was helpful. Dislike if it wasn't helpful. And leave me a comment telling me why. I hope this stuff is making sense. Uh, let me know in the comments if you have any questions. I'm here to help. And I just want to say thank you again. And I'll see you in the next video.